Hi everybody, thanks for coming. Today's Spirit Cafe guest is Janet McIntyre. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> All right! <laughs> <laughs> she built timber frame houses in Vermont. And she opened her business in 2006 and now she has seen year round employees. Everybody, thanks for coming. Enjoy the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for that introduction. I, it was really fun to have um, Chris come down to my shop yesterday and check out the scene, so I appreciate your time there. Do it again. And but Jen. <laughs> um, so, I think um, I'm going to talk for about 10 or 15 minutes about what my job is, um, what timber framing is, if people have questions about that, and then I would love to hear any questions you all have for me um, about construction in general, timber framing specifically, um, what my job is in the company. There's sort of all these layers to talk about. Um, so, I'll start by describing the company that I work for a little bit more. Um, as Chris said, we were founded in 2006. Um, I actually didn't start working there until 2011, so I've been there for eight years now, which I think officially makes me an old person. Um, it's a worker-owned company, which means that if you're an employee there, after a period of time, you can buy in and become an owner. Um, so I did that three years ago, um, and that's a really awesome part of my job, to sort of own the work you do and get to make decisions about um, what projects you're going to take on. Um, so we are mostly a timber framing company. We do general construction. We build um, houses and little gazebos and trailhead kiosks. We build a whole bunch of different stuff. But everything that we do involves timber framing. So timber framing is a type of post and beam building. And if you know what that is, and you could just like give a little, little head nod, you know what post and beam building is. Okay, not seeing enough of those. So I'm going to describe what that is. So um, post and beam means that, so when we look around this room, well, this is, the structure here is concrete. But if you're inside of a house, most of the time you look around and you can't see any wood. Right, you just see like flat walls, maybe some, maybe you see some wood paneling, but you can't see like the structure of the building. So post and beam building is, you're using really wide, like eight inch by eight inch timbers. Like you take a tree out of a forest and you cut it into a square rectangle shape, right? That's a timber. So you have posts standing up straight, like I'm a post. Here's a beam, also a timber, right? A beam's horizontal. Um, and you're using those really large timber elements to hold up your roof and frame out your walls. Like that's the structure of the house or the barn or whatever it is. Um, and if you can see those members, um, or most of the time in post and B buildings, you can see those members. The walls are built outside the frame. Um, compared to the way that most buildings are built now, um, it's a method called stick frame construction. So it's using two by fours, like much smaller pieces of wood. You go down to the lumber yard, you buy a bunch of two by fours, um, you build a wall and then you cover it so you can't see the framing. So now if you know what post and beam building is and you can give a little head nod, that sort of made sense. Okay, that's at least half, that's great. So timber framing, um, which is what my company does, is a type of post and beam building. So post and beam is this big family of construction and timber framing is like a member of that family. And what, what makes something a timber frame is where those pieces of wood join together. There's no nails or screws or anything. They're cut like puzzle pieces so that they fit one another. And you put a wooden peg through those cuts and that's what holds the joints together. See a couple nods. So I'm gonna show, I think, show an example of that here. Um, some of you can see this. I'll put it in the middle of the room so people who are further away can see it. 
This is, um, this is a picnic table. This is one of the things my company builds. Simple little picnic table. Um, this is sort of a product that we make and you, know, you can go to our website and see how much it costs and click on it and buy one. Um, it's a picnic table that has a roof built in. Um, and I brought it just because you can see some of the, what's called joinery. So, so this would be a post, right? And these would be beams in the simplest terms. And right where they meet, they're cut so that they fit together. So this is a curving cherry tie beam. And it's got a joint that sticks through this post. And there's a little wooden peg that connects it. Can you all in the back see that? Mm -hmm. Or should I bring this closer? Yes. Cool. Um, so that's what timber framing is. So that's what we do at my company. Um, I was sort of drawn to learn how to build like this because I, I wanted a job that was going to have some physical component. Um, I do actually like sitting and reading and staring at a computer some, but I also know that I'm really happy when I'm using my body and making stuff. When I'm lifting heavy things, it makes me happy. I don't know if anybody can empathize with that. But physical work feels really good to me, and so I wanted, I wanted a job that incorporated that. Um, I love the way that timber frames look. I love the way that um, it's much easier in the timber framing world to use um, local trees. So all the wood that we build with comes from Vermont. Um, we work with one sawyer who uh, has his own wood lot. He goes out and picks. You know, we tell him. We need 28 by 8 by 20 foot long timbers. He goes out into his wood lot, finds the trees, cuts them down, saws them up, and delivers them. Um, I think that is pretty neat. That was the thing that inspired me about timber framing. Um, and my personal journey is that I started out doing this. I went to a, there's a place there's a couple of places where you can go and like take a one week class about timber framing, and you learn some of the basic ways to use the tools, you, use, um, you learn how to read a set of plans, I'll show you guys in a second, and then you build a frame in a week. It's a really neat thing. Um, so I went to a school like that, took a couple of classes, and that was kind of my introduction, and took a job with a builder. We built a house, I loved it, and I just kind of kept rolling with it and ended up where I am. Um, and then I had a baby. And it's pretty hard to like <coughs> use a chainsaw and pick up 300 pound timbers when you're pregnant. So I had to learn some other skills so that I could keep working in this industry. So um, my job sort of morphed. I still do some timber framing, but what I do now is mostly, um, it's twofold. I make sets of plans. So again, I'll show you in a second. Um, and I keep up our website. <coughs> which means I like write all the words. If you go to our website, I write all the words, I pick the photos, I kind of did the whole layout. Um, and I make these shop drawings now, so I'll pass these around. This is, um, this is the barn that we're building right now in my shop. Um, it's a three-story barn. The third floor is gonna be turned into an apartment eventually. Um, and I'll pass these around, you can flip through the pages but basically, it's a set of joinery notes where I tell everybody, like, here's how big these joints should be. Um, when you make a peg, here's where to put it. Just sort of describing how to put the building together. And then there's a set of what are called elevations. If you're looking at just like a 2D cut through the building, a section through the building, that's an elevation. So, you know, here's a picture of where every timber in the frame is supposed to be. Um, so this is a lot of what I do now, sort of a, I'm not quite the designer, like we have somebody else in our business who's designing these buildings, but I'm taking their concepts and making them into a, um, a thing that our timber framers can use. Um, let's see, and I think before I jump into questions, I'll just quickly describe some of these tools that I brought. Um, 
So at our shop, and this is pretty typical for timber frame shops, we do a mix of hand tool work and power tool work. So Chris saw this in our shop. We have like um, giant circular saws. Um, a circular saw is the most common one that you see has an eight inch wide blade, seven and a quarter inch wide blade. It's like a little circular blade and you hold onto a handle and you can push a button and the blade starts to spin. So we have a bunch of those, but we have really giant ones too, so you can just slice off the end of a timber. Um, we have specialized power tools to make holes in wood. We have a bunch of specialized things you can plug in and make a lot of noise with. Um, and then we also have, we also all have our own set of hand tools. So um, we're doing some power tool work and then finishing the joints with chisels, which are these. Um, this might be a thing that people have, has anybody seen this before? Chisel? Lots of nods, cool. Yeah, so this is, um, anybody who's doing woodworking is using a chisel. Timber frame chisels are big and heavy and they're sort of easy to drive through the wood. Um, but if you're building a set of cabinets, you're using the same tool, but it's small and delicate and easy to sort of make slices with. Um, mallet, which is what you use to knock on the end of a chisel to pop some wood out. Um, this is a plane. There's a bunch of different kinds of planes. It's used to either smooth the wood, like if you want a nice um, finished surface, you can smooth the outside of a timber with this. Um, also used to clean out the joints. And this is a layout tool. So um, before we actually cut the joints, we have to, with a pencil, we have to mark out where all the joinery is going to happen. So this is a tool that you can use to, like if this is a, this would be a huge timber, but if this was the surface of a timber, I can take this tool and register it against the side. And now I have an easy way to draw lines that are parallel to the edge of this timber um, at one inch increments along the timber. So it's a super specialized timber framing tool, but um, if you're a timber framer, you want one of those. This is your kit if you want to be a timber framer. Um, and this is the old, so before there were, um, I mentioned the word chain mortiser. We have, a chain mortiser is the way that we make the, punch the holes in the timbers, the mortises. Um, it looks like, it basically looks like a chainsaw, but it goes this way. It's on a stand and you can just push it right directly into the wood. Um, before there were chain mortisers, there was a tool called the boring machine, even though it's the most awesome machine ever. And what it is, is it's, it's a machine that holds this drill bit in place. So it's a stand, it has um, a chuck that holds onto this drill bit, and you have these handles that you move like a bicycle, and it spins this bit into the wood and makes a round hole. Um, so that's the old fashioned way of doing that. Um, so I think I'm gonna open it up to questions. Hopefully you have some. I could keep talking, but I'd rather talk about what you want me to talk about. Um, so thanks for coming. And, you know, carpentry is still kind of considered uh, a pretty non-traditional trade for women, right? There's more men in the field than women. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you have for uh, the young women in the crowd who might have an interest in getting into uh, the field of carpentry? That's a great question. Um, well, first I should mention uh, Rosie's Girls. There's an awesome program in Vermont. Um, the larger organization is called Vermont Works for Women, and its goal is to train, uh, they might train young men too, but the goal is to train women in, in non-traditional fields. Um, they have an offshoot program called Rosie's Girls that's specifically for um, people in middle school and high school, and they run a lot of really neat programs. Um, I guess what I would say is the world is, it feels to me like the world is changing for the better and um, there, if you're interested in this as a trade, you might come across some bumps along the way, but for the most part, people that I've come across have been very open to me being in kind of a man's world. And um, 
don't be afraid to ask questions. There's a lot of really good people out there who are willing to be your teachers. And um, if you can kind of like come at this with a positive attitude, then um, we just hired, we're, for this barn project, we were scrambling for um, people to work on site. We needed three more people to sort of finish out the barn once it's raised. We just hired three women to fill those positions. It was so awesome. awesome. We had a field of like, uh, I think four or five people applied for the job and the three women seemed like they were gonna be the best fit. And so, I don't know, more and more it feels like there are, and not just women, but people who are non-traditional for um, carpentry in general um, are, are out there and doing this work. That's great, thanks. So, yeah, and it's a very support, like, I think I know all the women carpenters in northern and central Vermont. Like it's a very, very supportive group of women, um, especially the ones who are older and have been around for a longer time. A lot of mentors. That's great. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. What is that thing next to the, uh, looks like kind of like a knife? This thing? Yeah. Um, it is a knife. It's called a draw knife. Um, this thing is used for making the pegs that hold our joints together. Um, super cool tool. The way that you use it is um, you sit down on something called a shave horse and you can kind of clamp your work with your feet and you draw this towards yourself and shave off little bits of wood. That makes sense? It's a little hard to picture, but. It's, it's like a fine woodworking tool. It's for taking just like small shavings off of something. P woodworkers use this too to shape all kinds of stuff. Like if you're going to make a spoon, you might start by clamping a block of wood and kind of shaving off little bits until you have a rough spoon shape. Does anybody live in a timber frame house? You do? Yeah. Kind of. Or a post and beam house? Yeah. You can see the timbers? My mom's picking the ceiling. We have two floors, but the ceiling is the first floor. Uh huh. Up in the ceiling? Neat. Cool. Yeah, it's a very um, traditional way of building in this area. That's another thing that really drew me towards timber framing is it's, um, it's from this part of the country. I mean, it's, I shouldn't say that. It's from Europe. Mm -hmm. It's from, there's, there's histories of timber framing in most places in the world where there's lots of snow and lots of big trees. So it's easy to build a really hefty, durable building that can stand, withstand big snow loads. Snow is very heavy. I don't know if that's intuitive for people, but um, I don't know what the snow load is here, but in, in Montpelier, when you design a building, you, you design it for a 60 pound per square foot snow load, meaning that if you can picture one foot by one foot, you have to have a building that can hold up 60 pounds in that small area. So timber frames do that really well. It's pretty easy to, to build a very strong building. Um, <coughs> with big beefy timbers. So, you know, Japan and Russia and Northern Europe and, um, and Korea, all these places have hit long histories of timber framing. And when Europeans came here, um, all of the original buildings they built were posts and beam buildings. So I love being able to go into an old barn and checking out how people um, did things then that I'm doing today. Because the trade has morphed a little bit, but but the basic like mortise and tenon joint with a pinned connection is the same. Yeah. Did you make your own toolbox? I did make my own toolbox. Yes. This was my one of my first woodworking projects. So long ago, decades. Well, at least one decade. Um, yeah, and that's another thing. One of Chris's questions yesterday was for somebody who's sort of interested in. Um, learning more about this or, or thinking they might want to be a timber framer someday, um, the piece of advice I thought of is um, just try making something. You know, it could be like a step. 
get a couple pieces of wood and, you know, put two of them like this and put another one on top and nail it together and just like figure out how stuff works. I think there's no, um, there's no carpentry manual, you know, I'm sure there is a carpentry manual, but there's like, you don't go and get a five year degree in construction the same way that you do for other kinds of jobs. Usually if some, if you're looking to hire someone, um, you say you want somebody with five years of experience. You don't say you want somebody with a bachelor of science degree and blah, 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 you know? So the more you can like get your hands on stuff and just try stuff out, um, the more skills you pick up, the more you can tell if you really like doing this kind of work. So, yeah, build a toolbox. And then you can buy a bunch of tools. What is the blue thing there? This thing? Yes. Um, this is called a string line. Um, it's used for, all, it's, this is a general construction tool, like most carpenters will have a string line in their um, tool bags. It's used for figuring out, um, it's used for, making a straight line. So um, the way that that I use this the most, my company does a lot of using like curvy, funky shaped beams in a timber frame. And we need a way of figuring out like where is, we want this beam to be like this one. We want this to be horizontal, right? But what's horizontal if it's a curving thing? Um, so what we'll do is stretch this out I won't make too much of a mess of the library floor. And if I held this and somebody came here and pinched it and pulled it up and let it snap yeah. down. Yeah. Just like that and you just snap it right Boing. against it. <laughs> Not it go on it right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You must have used one of these before. Yeah, I've, I've actually, I've been, work, I've worked in carpentry in so Oh, cool. Everything you're talking about. Oh, nice. Cool. It's exciting. It's a really great field. Uh, I actually started uh, construction after I got a four-year degree, so it doesn't matter, you know, if you have a degree or not. If you like something, you like doing something, go for it. It's great. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so you snap this line back and it leaves um, some chalk. You all can see on my foot. It leaves a blue, but blue chalk line on whatever you snapped it on and it's a perfectly straight line. So we'll take a curving thing and snap a line on it and then we can know, okay, if I want to make a cut that's going to be plumb or like straight up and down in the building, it's going to be 90 degrees to that. We have something to measure off of. It's a little tricky to visualize that without a timber here, but makes a straight line. Yep. Um, my dad has one of those. He's a carpenter. Cool. <laughs> Just proving that people who are carpenters, like this is a, carpenters probably get like a measuring tape and then a framing square. Does anybody know what a framing square is? Speed square. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? A speed square? Yeah. Yeah, so speed square, right. If you're doing general construction, it's probably like measuring tape, speed square, framing square, which is a little different. It's bigger. So it looks like a big L. I guess L would be this way. No, for you, L would be this way. And this part's two feet and this part is 18 inches. And you can lay out angles and stuff or straight lines on a timber. And then like number four is the snap line. So super common. Sean? I mean, Mr. McIntyre? Uh, so you talked about how, how things get cut and that you use these, these big beams for post and beam. How do you put together something like a three-story barn? And so it all gets cut at the shop and then you're out there where it's gonna be, how does it all how does it all stand up? Stand up. Great question. Um, so the most common way now for a professional building company is to hire a crane. Um, so this giant machine comes, it's got a big old arm that sticks up, a chain hangs down from it with a big heavy ball on the end, um, and there's a hook, and you just lift up these three, four, or five hundred pound timbers and put them into place. Um, the old fashioned way before there were cranes, or if you're trying to not spend a bunch of money because cranes are very expensive, you call up all of your friends and um, I wish I had, well, who's got those plans? Are those still kicking around? Thank you. So um, what you would do is you would put together a whole section of the building. Um, so let me turn to a page of a section.
So you would put a bunch of these timbers together. So probably what we'll do for this burn is um, on the ground, lay out flat, we'll put together these big tall posts, these ones in the middle, that big tall post, this beam, and a couple of these angled pieces are called braces. Um, and they're what keeps the building from racking, which means like the wind blows really hard, your building doesn't creak because there's a triangle. The brace has made a really strong shape. So we'll assemble these things on the ground, right? The post will be laid out like that, and the beams going across. And then um, if we're going to lift up that way, you get a whole bunch of people, and everybody stands there and lifts it at the same time. And then if it's super tall, you have poles, and you can push on it with poles and it stands up and you hold it there forever until you get the next piece up and then when everything is starting to interlock it it stands up by itself so and we do that a fair amount actually um i don't know if we're unusual compared to other building companies but um we just have a fair number of clients who say this is a big barn but if you had a sort of a smaller structure people would rather save the money and have a big party with their friends and hand raise a building. Super fun. Cranes are fun too. You can just do it with like an excavator if you have a machine. I'm sorry? You can do it with like an excavator. Yep. Machine. Yep, totally. Yeah, anything that can get up high and lift enough weight. Have you seen that happen before? Uh, I built a short-term garage with my dad and a different for house and stuff like that. Nice. All right. Yeah, you can do it that way, too. How, how long will a typical structure last, like compared to a stick-built structure? How, how long can a timber frame last? Are there ones that are you know, a couple hundred years old in the world? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so that's one of the things that timber frames are known for, is their longevity. I think the oldest frame now is 1,500 years old, something like that. It's in Japan. Um, they last a super long time. And it, I actually think that's just as much to do with the care that people take of those kinds of buildings as it is the fact that they're made out of posts and beams. Um, if, you, if you had an exposed building, like you put up your timbers and you just left it open to the weather, uh, wood would sort of disappear at a rate of an inch every hundred years. So if you had like a building and you just left it in the weather after a couple hundred years, it would be gone. But, but I think buildings that people take care of last for a really long time. Um, so timber frames, these days in the world of um, conventional construction being like 95% of the market, uh, it's, people are only really building timber frames because they really want them for some reason, right? Some people really want them because they think they're beautiful and they are slightly more expensive than c conventional buildings. Like if you built the same building side by side, conventional stick frame two by fours versus a timber frame building, the timber frame would cost a little bit more. Um, it doesn't cost a ton more, but it is more expensive. So you have to really want it. Um, whether you want it because you think it's beautiful or because you want it to last forever or because you want to use local timber or because you want to make it yourself and you took this class and it's just a super fun thing to do, um, you're going to take care of it because you love it more. right? You can make a beautiful conventional stick-framed house that's really awesome and pass it down through generations and take really good care of it and I think it's going to last just as long as a timber frame building. It's a little meta, but... Um, what do you primarily use for your roofs? Your, your often your frame? Like on top of the frame? Like asphalt shingles or... Yeah. We usually use metal. Do you use like a standing seam or what? Um, it's totally up to the client. Um, we actually don't usually put the roofs on ourselves. We do if it's... um. Uh, What's the other kind? The not standing seam metal roof. Yeah, there's a different word for it. The channel drain. If it's a channel drain roof, which is just, it's corrugated metal. Um, 
we might do that ourselves, but uh, standing seam is sort of a specialized, you need like a, a tool that can bend a sheet of metal in a particular way. Um, and that's just not what we do, so. Uh, but usually houses, so, so for people who are not familiar with these things, um, metal is a great choice for roofs around here. It sheds snow really well. Um, so a lot of people make that choice. You can put it up pretty fast, too. Yeah, exactly. You can put it up fast. Um, it tends to be a little bit more expensive than like asphalt shingles, but it lasts for a long time. I think 30 years is the, um, like what you can get insured for, basically. And, uh, but standing seam and channel drain are two different types of metal roofs. Um, and standing seam you sort of have a, a slightly better chance of water never getting into your roof. So it's a little bit more expensive and but a little bit higher quality. So oftentimes people who are building houses will choose standing seam and farms um, or other buildings will choose channel drain. But, but it's totally up to the client. Well, we have time for one more quick question if anyone else has one. All right, guys, can we have a round of applause for Janet?